Please note that this video has spoilers for the subject. Put off by how long this video is, don't worry, I tend to jam-pack my videos with as much content, as many details as I possibly can, and I try to talk pretty fast, so while the video is a bit on the long side, I don't repeat myself, and I get into a lot of details about the subject that, you know, pretty much anything that I feel I can comment on and that I think you might find interesting. Watchmen movie thoughts. I will start this video by not only announcing the first subject I will be going into, but also referencing one of my favorite theme songs. They made Watchmen without the slimy squid. I'm not terribly bothered by this. For one thing, everything about the squid that's in the graphic novel was something that when not in the film, you don't miss as much when you realize that the squid isn't Adrian's plan. The... I like it fine in the graphic novel. I'm honestly not fond of either particularly... I think but both have some problems with them. But if you were going to cut something, the all the scenes setting up the squid were something that would really, you know, make more sense to cut. It's not, it's not important backstory for main characters, and it doesn't set up, you know, that much for the sort of supporting cast. I mean, I really like the supporting cast, but very little of the stuff with the squid actually really has to do with the supporting cast. I mean, I should say, right off the bat, by the way, I am going to be spoiling the graphic novel in this. Yeah, I... So, yeah, with that out of the way, I mean, I love the two Bernies, and, and Joey, and... Crap, I don't remember her girlfriend, but they're entirely... You, know, you just... You, you get it, and the way they introduce all these supporting characters in New York, and then at the end just bring them all together and have it escalate into a conflict. It keeps cutting between character and character, and suddenly you realize all of this is going on at the same time, and you don't know what time it is at first, and then you see, you know, you, you find out that... Uh, I think this is after Vate tells you, I did it 35 minutes ago, then you see, you know, all of it going together, and then you see the cop car and the the digital watch, whatever, the, the watch there, saying, you know, 23, 25, you know, 35 minutes before midnight, and then you see the, the blast, and the two Bernies hug and become the two silhouetted people that you had those two, the, the couple of different interpretations of, and it's just devastating. I, I, I think it's also an, a kind of interesting change that where the graphic novel focuses kind of on the aftermath and shows a lot of that. The film spends more time showing the sort of attack. You don't really see... In, in the graphic novel, you basically see the big white light. And then you see all the bodies and all these nasty ways they died. And it's, it's so effective. I, it's, it's such... It's such a subversive ending. It, it is potentially anticlimactic, but I really find that neither the graphic novel nor the film has it feeling like it's anticlimactic, which is really impressive. I'm not surprised that Alan Moore pulled it off, but I am a little surprised that Zack Snyder pulled it off, honestly. But, yeah, the... Yeah, where the film shows the buildings getting knocked over and all this with the blast expanding, and then only very briefly shows the aftermath and barely shows any bodies at all, even for being an R-rated movie. Anyway, The Squid and Dr. Manhattan, framing Dr. Manhattan. The Squid, as far as I understand, it's cloned from human DNA. 
or at least part of it is, does that mean that Adrian doesn't think that they're going to, you know, pick apart its DNA, try to find weaknesses, notice that it's human, and realize that it's not at all, excuse me, that it's not at all alien? And the part where I kind of, I know it's a comic book, but they cloned a psychic person's brain so that they could implant all these input, you know, sounds and images and all of this stuff. It's a clever idea, but I just wish... It's the only time psychics are mentioned in the graphic novel, I'm almost certain. And I just don't feel like it's the kind of thing that... I don't know, time travel you could kind of get away with. You know, you can have a character traveling in time without it being established that much, because that's kind of something we accept as an idea within science fiction. But psychic energy, that's right into fantasy. There is no actual... Anyway. Now, with the... Yeah, I also... I, I guess the idea of the deaths by the squid is that the psychic, you know, the, the people who are closest to it get heart attacks because of all the psychic, all the, all the input, all the sudden input. I don't know. I don't know enough to, to say that that couldn't happen. Okay, I, I guess that could, maybe. But, if you... Yeah, I, th I think that's pretty much what I wanted to say about the squid. Now, Dr. Manhattan, framing Dr. Manhattan, my friend, Peter Roller, Ro Ro I, th I think that's how you pronounce it, correct me if I'm wrong, Peter, is, he feels that the, that Dr. Manhattan would not have agreed to it, considering how upset he, he becomes when he is accused of causing cancer. And I'm inclined to agree, it seems like he wouldn't really have been okay with killing that many people. Is it just because he doesn't know them personally? Or is it because he went ahead and no longer was that, you know, attached to Earth? I don't know, I just don't quite... yeah. And then... I also heard the point raised, I don't remember exactly where, that it could very well be that the Russians would just attack America because America created Dr. Manhattan, and that could also be the case. I... Yes, my... I... I also asked my father what he thought of the concept, and he pointed out that people are too well informed. I would personally argue that the majority of the world's population would believe in, you know, an outside source attacking us all. I think there are two, I think the majority of human beings would believe in something that they don't actually see if there is, you know, even if there is a lot of proof against that being the case, they would still believe it. I, I think that we have the capacity to just resign to accept something even if it isn't, even if a lot speaks against it. However, I would agree with him that there are still, it might be in a minority, but there are many of us who would not accept it as such. And I could spend a long time explaining why it couldn't be aliens. If you, if you just look up, just look into how far away the nearest, I don't remember, I think, I guess planet or something, where there could be life how long it would take and how fast you would have to go for aliens to get here. And even in 85, we knew, you know, a lot about the, 
you know, about space and the universe, so yeah. And finally, my own point. It would not work because it is the same idea that religion works on, and religion has consistently proven to fail to get people in line. Once enough people are a part of the collective, they will start to get cut off into you know, minor groups, and they will make alterations to the beliefs. I should maybe explain why I feel it is similar to religion. The idea is that something outside, which we can't currently see or feel or touch, is threatening all of us at once. We, we have to remember, historically, the idea of collective punishment, of everyone being punished if even one individual, one part of the pack, made a mistake. Historically, that is a very old idea. That has lasted for a long time. And if you think back, if you think of how we humans, you know, what, what we were like before, we had more advanced societies and could protect ourselves better, it makes sense. If one person strays too far from the group and, you know, is attacked by wild animals, maybe he'll accidentally lead the wild animals or the predators back to the main group. Or if, you know, if one person you know, chases away the food that is to be eaten by not only him, but also the others, then there might not be enough food for the entire group of human beings. If, in ancient times, when, as some people still believe it today, when natural disasters occur, we would blame that on unseen gods, or spirits, or the like, and we would blame ourselves, we would decide that we must have done something, or we must not be doing something. Either way, something about us is displeasing the power which makes that happen, and we must satisfy it again. Or we must stop doing whatever dissatisfied it in the first place, possibly both. And that is this same idea with the outside enemy and it doesn't last. They, they will splinter off into different groups, make alterations to the overall beliefs. I mean, just think about how many different versions of Christianity there are. Th think about the fact that Islam splintered into two separate groups that hate each other with a passion. This happened right after excuse me, right after the death of the Prophet Muhammad. It, it just, it doesn't last. You can't unite people. What, it, it didn't work to unite the, you know, the, the people of the Middle East into Islam. It created two different groups of Islam who now attack each other over the dominance. And that is what would happen. Maybe it wouldn't happen right away. But in a generation, maybe less, there would be people saying, because what you have to remember is, it's not just about the different countries not attacking each other. They're also or not attacking each other over like land or what political system should reign, should it be communism or capitalism, which is what which it was back then, which it was back then. There's also the matter of how do we deal with the, you know, whether you think it's Manhattan or aliens, do we build defenses in case they come back? Do we seek them out and destroy them so they can't come back? Do we do a third option? And these groups would gather members and then they would fight each other. And this is, it, it would just start over again. I don't think that 
Alan Moore didn't realize this, I think he wanted us to realize that for ourselves. I think he wanted us to think about what would it do to the world if this, you know, was attempted. And I do think that it's definitely worth noting Veidt is not, he's not evil, he's, he is, as, as Spoonie likes to say, I don't remember who he's quoting, you are, if everyone is the hero of their own story, and Veidt, he's an idealist. He, he is certain that he can change the world for the better. And through this, he can actually make it, you know, make, make the whole, yeah, to just cause global harmony. And I, I wish they hadn't very clearly in the film d done lines where they kind of condemn it. I mean, they have that... Yeah, they, they, just, they, they have a couple of different things that kind of say that he's actually, you know, that, like Dan confronts him and say, you're, you're deforming humanity, this isn't humanity, and this kind of stuff. And I, I don't think that was really necessary. And, but, but yeah, it's also, I do like that they did keep the final, you know, image with the, the crank file. Although I, it's not completely perfectly recreated. It, ideally, the smiley should still be in the shot there at the end. Although they do get the, you know, he accidentally spills some, you now ketchup down the, the smiley shirt. So that's good at least. Now, I could not talk too much about the characters in the review since I would be spoiling too much, but here I can. So, I guess I will... I will start with Dan. Basically, he's, he's kind of a nerd, and I don't say that with any kind of judgment, because I am a nerd. It's, you know, astonishingly good looks, notwithstanding. And he kind of just, he has this boyish fantasy of going out, you know, there's even the, the Veidt has the line, enough with your schoolboy heroics, you know, grow up, Dan. He's kind of a boy, he just wants to go out and beat up the bad guys and win the girl at the end. And putting on a costume is kind of the only way he feels like he's good enough. He, he has to pretend to be someone else. He never progressed. I don't want to say like, I, I don't mean anything bad by it. It's just that he, he's basically into role playing. I don't even mean that in the sexual sense. Although in the, it is obviously also in the sex, sexual sense, but he role plays to feel better. And that's, there's nothing wrong with that. Not that there's anything wrong with that. He just, that, that's how he, he does it, you know, and a lot, of, a lot of guys want to, you know, go out and be the hero and, you know, take out the bad guys and win the girl in the end. And, yeah, that's, that's what he's doing. And well, I did already talk about Laurie in the review, so, yeah, that pretty much... I don't have a lot to say about Sally, but yeah, you know, that there's clearly she does still love Eddie, and there is just this kind of thing where, you know, there's, there's, like, like John says, he has, she has every reason to hate Eddie, but she, at the end of the day, she can't. She, she does hate him when she sees Lori with him because you know she doesn't she wants to protect Lori from him but at the same time she does still love him and when she did and you know when she did go ahead and have sex with him consensually and and conceive Lori that was you know that was after the attempted rape and it was a brutal rape. I, I really do appreciate Zack Snyder's 
reverence in that scene. I don't think he altered pretty much anything. He might have added a blow or two, but it was a disturbing, disgusting rape attempt in the graphic novel, and it is every bit as just... I find that a lot of... a lot of... a lot of depictions of rape in fiction have this tendency to kind of eroticize it, sexualize it, instead of focusing on the the assault and the the physical and emotional damage, especially emotional, and it's it's highly unappealing. I, I don't think that's really the way you should do it. It seems like those people have kind of just a fetish for that or something, and that in itself is basically fine as long as they don't actually, you know, as long as they don't do anything unconsensual, you know, I don't, I don't have a problem with, excuse me, rape fantasies as long as you, yeah, as long as both parties living out the fantasy are aware that it's a fantasy and they're not doing anything to the other that is not okay with the other, but when doing fiction where it's supposed to be taken seriously, I think you should take it seriously. Alan Moore takes it seriously as he usually does, when he, he does not use rape lightly in his stories. And Zack Snyder takes it seriously, and yeah, I, I don't know, maybe he actually, he really resented taking it seriously in this one, and hence the feminist movie Sucker Punch. Anyway, the Yes, the, the uh, Dr. Manhattan, John Osterman, over the course of it, as uh, I heard uh, Billy Crudup, the actor, by the way, I meant to say this in the regular review, the acting is great. The only person I really had a problem with of the main cast is, you know, Malin Okerman. Other than that, they really, it, Rorschach is perfect. Jackie O'Haley is Rorschach. He may not be Freddy Krueger, but he is Rorschach. And this movie really got him on the map as well, which I'm quite glad for. I'm, I'm happy to see him, excuse me, more. Anyway, the... Oh, and the comedian as well. And the casting as well. Not just the acting, but they really... Found, Dan looks exactly like he should. I love that we keep seeing him, like... Wiping his glasses clean, you know, it's, it's such a nerdy image, and it's used in the graphic novel, and it's used in the film. Anyway, yeah, the... As Billy Crudup himself says in an interview, Dr. Manhattan goes from antipathy to apathy over the course of the story. He starts out basically... He's not really fond of human beings, he's just kind of, oh, okay, you know, I'm... I'm employed by the Pentagon, they're telling me I have to go kill people, I have to go, uh, you know, fight the Vietnam War, and he, so he does it, you know, he's, I, I guess he's kind of still on the payroll, he was working for the military even when doing the experiments, I think, so yeah, and he, I, I like what Billy Crudup does with having just a little bit of emotion in his voice and then at, at times, I guess really the only time where there's more than a little emotion is when he, well, when John Osterman gets caught in the intrinsic field, crap, the, the subtractor, intrinsic field subtractor, something like that, and when he yells, leave me alone. The... Um, you know, those are really the only times where he's... And, and the fact that Janie runs off, just like in the graphic novel. I also feel like the, some of those moments that are very accurate to the graphic novel really evoke emotions. There were times where I was really invested, and it, it really got to me. You know, the... 
yeah, like the the stuff with Manhattan, both the the talk show and you know Jamie, the the backstory bit, and the you know Laurie learning that the comedian was her father. Now, but but yeah, so Doctor Manhattan is him leaving, of course. Pretty much, it, it gets very, very close to setting off World War III because he was the one thing, you know, with him there, the balance was in America's favor, which provoked the Russians because they had no reason to... It, uh, the idea of mutually assured destruction is, of course, that the two sides are equally powerful. You can't do it with one side being more powerful. And it's kind of American to want to be the more powerful. And I'm, I'm not even really going to bother saying no offense, because saying no offense is kind of irritating to the other party, you know. Yeah, so him taking off, of course, pretty much says it. And, and it also really tells us that he is, okay, because he kind of does realize that, you know, he, he is he's aware that, or at least he doesn't come back instantly when he is told that pretty much World War III is breaking out. And, yeah, I, I like how he is genuinely objective. It's, it's even more clear in the graphic novel, but they get it across fairly decently in the film. He genuinely doesn't think of life as necessarily better than non-life. And that's interesting because that's kind of something that we take for granted. That's sort of the cornerstone of ethics is life is a good thing, all life is important, thus we should ensure that all life is as positive and lasts as long and remains as positive as possible. You know, people shouldn't die before they have to, people shouldn't live you know, suffering unless it's completely unavoidable and something like that. And, and without the core idea in place of life automatically being a good thing, that leads to another set of morals, a, a different set. And I, yeah, I think that's interesting to have a character like that. And again, he's not a bad guy. He just doesn't really see a, yeah, it's, it just doesn't really mean anything to him anymore because he lost the one thing that was keeping him there. And, yeah, the, I have already talked some about Vate. I'm not sure I should say too much more. The, um, I will say about Vade, I like that he is very clearly superior in fighting prowess to the others. The graphic novel makes this very clear as well, and the, um, the movie kind of sets it up right at the beginning, with, with, without us knowing that that's Vade, when the comedian is killed because we see that someone is taking out the comedian and we see how big and muscly a guy he is and we see him fighting back, he throws knives, he fires a gun, he really, you know, he's not just taking it and we see him fight, we see how strong he is, we see how ruthless he is and yet this guy took him out and when they realize that Vate is, and, and they're going to have to go up against them, we also realize, crap, that guy who took out the comedian can actually, is actually going to fight them. And he can take them both out. And it's, yeah, you know, it's, it's a very, it's, it's convincing, I feel. And as, as far as the action goes in this movie. 
I kind of wish they hadn't brought in Bobastis because they don't explain him at all and really there's no need for Bobastis to be there other than sort of being among the only the only living thing he really interacts with in the graphic novel. In the graphic novel, it's also kind of preventing Rorschach from attacking. Because in the, in the graphic novel, again, the action is very much just, you know, I'm gonna fight you if I have to, or if I really, yeah, if I need to. And at one point, Bastis shows up and prevents Night Owl and Rorschach from attacking Vate. And Rorschach is kind of telling him, you know, send. Vait, send the send the cat away. Vait, send the cat away. I, so so I can fight you. And and Vait is like, no, I don't want to you know, humiliate you with another defeat. And that's kind of he doesn't really want to fight. And with that not being an issue in the film, he very clearly doesn't mind fighting. The only thing that the genetically spliced links, I think is what it's described as, is therefore is being evaporated along with Dr. Manhattan. And I don't see how it was necessary to do that. And they're not even going to do the, the genetically engineered squid, so I don't see why we needed anything genetically engineered, because that was also what Bobasis was kind of. He was setting up, we have this, you know, cloning technology. Now... Yes, that pretty much covers Vate. Labors. Yeah, so we're left with Rorschach and the Comedian. I'm not gonna shut up once I start, talk, start talking about Rorschach, so I guess I will do Comedian. Briefly, I'll just start by saying when this was released, you know, with Dr. Manhattan being naked, as he is in the graphic novel, we see his, you know, blue glowing penis. And as such, there were a lot of immature, you know, jokes about that in 2009 on the internet. And I just think it's a little sad that they're less mature than the guy who directed 300. Zack Snyder isn't making jokes about it in the film. He's not drawing attention to it. Why are you, why are you harping on it? I don't understand. It's in the graphic novel. It's not a big deal. Are you that? insecure about your heterosexuality. I, I, I don't get it. Would, would you be the same way around a, a Greek statue? Anyway, I'm, I'm not trying to be holier than thou, I just, I don't understand it. It's, I, I tried to notice in the film if it was terribly bad, what with all the comments it had gotten, and I, it's just, barely there. It's it's kind of the kind of thing where they could have even censored it, but they didn't, because why should they? It's just a penis. It's not even... No, nothing happens with it. I, I would... The, these people would have a point if there was, like, violence towards it. I, I think that would be crossing a line. I would think the same way for, you know, violence against a woman's... But yeah. So, comedian. I'm also really glad they got the Pagliacci joke in there. It was, it was quite good. And Rorschach. I just gotta briefly say, Rorschach had you believing he was Rorschach within the first few moments of him, you know, narrating and you seeing him on screen. That is freaking Rorschach. Just perfect. And they got the height right as well, because he is supposed to be a little shorter than the others, you know. He's a little less, yeah, comedian. He is one of the more interesting characters. He's, in theory, despicable. You feel like you should hate this guy, but at the end of the day, you don't completely hate him. There's I don't know, there's, there's a, I mean, one thing is that you understand him, especially in the graphic novel, but, yeah, I, I don't know, I, I can't really explain it, but for those who've only watched the movie, in the graphic novel, it's also that, you know, when he grew up on the streets, it was 
the streets were tough, you just had to be tougher. And that's pretty much his character in a nutshell. You have to think about it. He grew up on the street. He grew up in this bad neighborhood. The streets were tough. You had to be tougher. So that became his philosophy. When he sees bad, he makes himself worse. And in a way, I've, I've heard different theories. You could see... Maybe he's trying, he's testing out boundaries. Maybe he's seeing how far he'll, he can go before somebody stops him. He doesn't, you know, he, he, he reminds Manhattan, you could have stopped me. You could have prevented this whole thing. You could have made her not scar my face. You could have made the gun not work. But you didn't. You just stood there and watched. I also find that that's more effective in the graphic novel because he doesn't really seem to be trying to stop, physically stop. Where in the movie it seems like he's just too slow. And I feel like he's just more of an observing character. Which, again, that's, there are people like that. I myself am fairly... I'm more of an observer than an actor. Anyway, the... Actually, that reminds me, I really should say, part of the thing with Osterman is, of course, excuse me, and this is, again, clear in the, excuse me, graphic novel, but you do see it, excuse me, a little bit in the film, the, he's kind of more interested in thing, in how things work. He is not interested in human beings, because human beings are not logical, and we're not very dependable. We're very unpredictable, and a lot of the things that drive us, drive us in the wrong directions, sort of. It, it's like, you know, like we're, if, if we're hungry, we might eat too much, or if we're thirsty, we might drink something with, like, caffeine in it, or salt. Well, not salt. If we might drink something with caffeine in it, which is going to make us more thirsty. And... You know, things like that, and it's just, it's not very really logical, and he was never that interested in human beings to begin with, but then he, you know, once he became transformed, once he put himself back together, which he of course knew, because he knew how to put a clock back together, it just became that he was... Yeah, he, he became le even less interested in human beings, and then once he was useful as a weapon, he's useful as a tool or a weapon, and what does Nixon use him for? Of course, a weapon. He does not use him to build something fantastic that people can benefit from. There are still widespread social problems in the, the universe in both versions. I also really like that they actually do have someone graffiti who watches the Watchmen and not quite finish it and then it's destroyed by the Molotov at one point. That was a, a, good, a nice nod to be, because of course the movie's title the, and the graphic novel's title in the film it's wrongfully attributed to the group when there was never really a group they the first meeting kind of fell apart you know and besides in the in the graphic novel, they're called the Crime Busters, not the Watchmen. The Watchmen doesn't refer to the group. It refers to the watches, because Manhattan, he used to be a watchmaker. And Rorschach, have you noticed how many times he'll list the time of day when he, you know, does a journal entry? I am completely BSing this. Of course, it's about who watches the Watchmen. The old, I guess, Greek quote, I don't remember exactly who's it, who it's attributed to, but basically, how, are you, how can you be sure that the people you hire to protect people aren't going to abuse that power? Who keeps them in check? And that's a very important theme, because a lot of these costume vigilantes do things that the public are not happy with, and the government are not happy with. And it's also made much clearer in the graphic novel, they're not actually on, they're not working for the government, they're kind of just trying to, you know, they're doing it on their own, and 
the well, the, the fact that they're, the police were on strike because of them is mentioned in the film. Anyway, the comedian is yeah kind of testing boundaries, seeing if someone will stop him, and he's also kind of like Doctor Manhattan. He realizes how messed up the human race is at at our core. We're very cruel and very destructive. And again, he applies his philosophy. Be even tougher. Okay, life is going to be unbelievably cruel, then I'm going to shoot a pregnant woman in the face. I am going to, you know, torch people and smile as I do it. He's, he just doesn't care. He, you know, like, I, I think it's, yeah, Rorschach, he became a parody of it. He, because that's what he does. He doesn't sit down and cry. The one time he cries is when he realizes what Vape is going to do. The killing of billions is too much for him. You know, the, the killing of millions to save billions. And... I like the flashbacks involving him, you know, the, the, at the funeral where we see how he was in, you know, towards these various people and, yeah, how it all... And, and, and he's also absolutely perfectly cast. He looks exactly as he should and Jeffrey D. Morgan, who I really want to see more of now that I've seen him in Watchmen. And I think he's also been in more movies since. It's just fantastic for the role. Incredibly talented. Is there more I should say before I disappear into Rorschach? The a lot of the ambiguity is of course lost in the film. And it, it couldn't really be any other way. I'm a little... The, the ending is a little too upbeat, or it's upbeat, it's a little upbeat at least, and it really shouldn't be, because the ending is, again, very ambiguous. The, the entire comic is ambiguous. You're supposed to make up your own mind about, is this good or is this bad? And it even seems like they're going to keep fighting crime with their old identities and everything, and yeah, it just, I don't know, it, and yeah, some of the ambiguity lost is that the the the, the suspected child killer confesses to Rorschach, whereas in and it's a really obvious line. It's an it's a line that really reeks of the studio made us add this because otherwise we wouldn't be allowed to. It's it's too challenging of a scene, you know, but again, if if they hadn't had that in there, he wouldn't have gotten as much money from Hollywood to make this movie, you know, in Hollywood to make this movie. But, but yeah, and the... The, the psychiatrist, I feel like they cast him just right, as well as the, the, the black guy, the African-American, whatever, at the lunch line. You know, it's just perfect. You know, I'm, oh, well, you're Rorschach, you're kind of famous. I'm kind of famous too, ain't that right? Yeah, that's right. And he's about to stab him, and the whole thing, you know, it's just the voice in the face, and he looks like a guy who's taken out other guys. He, you know, big, strong guy. And the two, you know, big figure, the, the guys, I, I've seen him in other stuff. You know, he's, he's in a lot, he's, he's one of the various, crap, I don't know what's politically correct, little people, I guess. He, so he's in a bunch of different you know, movies and TV shows, and I like him in general, but he's really great as big figure, you know, and I, I like how, I feel like it would have been nice if he had been quicker to anger, like in the graphic novel, but I like that he does really show emotion near the end, you know, he gets really 
agitated when the, you know, when Rorschach gets the, you know, what do you have? Your fingers, my pleasure, and, you know, no, we're, we're too fat, we have to just cut through him, and, you know, when he drops the cigar, I think that was really good, really effective in conveying, this guy doesn't shake easily, you know, this guy, he didn't get really, you know, messed up about the, the, the jokes that Rorschach cracked at his expense, by, by the way, I love every single one of those, I know, I'm t starting to talk about Rorschach already, <laughs> But when, you know, so when he does show emotion, you know that it's serious. I would have liked to see the psychiatrist outside of the sessions. We only see him briefly before the explosion, the energy bomb. Dr. Manhattan, energy seeker, energy explosion, yes. And, yeah, I liked seeing his home life be wrecked by Rorschach, his own darkness be brought forth. You know, when you gaze into the abyss, the abyss gazes into you, and Rorschach reminds him of the darker sides that he himself hides, among other things by those, you know, those, those pills, prescription drugs that he uses to suppress it, which, in the graphic novel, you get these subtle little hints that he's using a lot of those, and you see that it's like, you know, do not take more than prescribed, and it would appear that he is, because we see him, you know, open and take, you know, open and take, and then we see him toss the empty thing out at a point, and, yeah, so, Rorschach is challenging his optimism, his enthusiasm, and bringing forth the darkness within, and he describes in the graphic novel how he doesn't see, he wants to see a flower when he looks at the Rorschach, but he sees, you know, and, and in the film it's just, it's your turn. What do you see? And uh, I love the Rorschach voice more than the Dark Knight voice, the the, the Batman growling voice. Anyway, yeah, the, he he describes it. I want to see a flower, but what I see is what was it? A cat, which has these glistening maggots crawling in it. But even that isn't quite the truth. Even that is hiding. What I really see is just darkness when we're all alone, and it's just, it's, it's great. It, it is, he in his own way is trying to save the world. He sees how bad a place it is, and he is going out there and trying to improve it and change it. And I wish that was in the movie, because he is one of the, yeah, people who try to save it. And that's, one of the things that the comic is kind of telling us, don't trust other people to go out and, you know, be the change you want to see in the world. I'm, I'm not sure uh, Alan Moore would put it quite as cornerly, cornerly as that, yeah, whatever, but I, I, that's what I'm getting from his character anyway. I would also like to note that the framing of Rorschach puts Vate at the Dark Knight Joker levels of planning. And that's not a spoiler for the Dark Knight, but just how could he know that Rorschach would be there at that exact time, that he would put the pieces together? You know, in the graphic novel, they agree to meet at a certain time, and Vate has set up the frame for that certain time. That makes sense. Now... I suppose that more or less... There's not a lot left to say. What I also meant to say in the review itself is, of course, that this is a more, it's a deep, complex look under the surface of the sort of mythical surface of, I said surface twice, I know, of the mythical comic book hero and showing all the dysfunction underneath. And, Basically, his core idea that the first, you know, where he started out was saying, let's have one of them die, and then we see all the stuff that was wrong in his life. We have these people thinking back to their experiences with him and thinking about all the stuff that was wrong with when it was, because that's also something these characters never really die. You know, when, when comic book heroes die, they're brought back. 
somehow, some way. Now, yes, I do believe that pretty well. Something I would also just briefly note, and then I'll get to Rorschach. Moore said that, or maybe it was Gibbons actually, but uh, Dave Gibbons, the artist for the story. But the story became less important than the storytelling in the graphic novel, which again is uh, a difficulty in adapting it for the solo screen. But yes, Rorschach. I love the character. I, I've loved him ever since I first read the graphic novel. I once did a short film based on the scene of him fighting off the police when he's framed from Moloch's murder, you know, with the pepper and flame, makeshift flamethrower. That is awesome. I, what I love about it is that he's just, he's in this impossible situation and he just makes it work. He finds out, you know, he's, of course he has hairspray. That's, sure, that's in most people's homes. And pepper, of course, you know, and in Rorschach's hands, those are weapons, you know, a, a cloud of pepper in your face. That's going to disorient you. You're not going to be able to fight after that. And the, the yeah, the, the mission flamethrower, you know, that's, yeah, that, that works as far as I know. You know, it's, it's flammable, and if you hold a lighter up in front of her, use the, yeah, you, you know what I mean. You know, as long as there's a flame in front, you can use it as a flamethrower like that. Now, the... And I like that they also incorporated his... The Walter Kovacs... Uh, what do you call it? Yeah, the... The Walter Kovacs face, and him walking around with the, the end is nigh. Although, I'm not sure we ever see that it says the end is nigh, at least through the theatrical cut. Anyway, the background of him makes a lot of sense. You know, he's this... His mother was a sex worker, and she basically didn't actually want to keep him, but she kind of just... Well, she did. Maybe she had some kind of, you know... The weakness for it. There's, there's a lot of cases of women who at first, even if they know that they have to adopt or abort, well, yeah, abort or adopt it to someone else, or give it up for adoption, that's what it's called, they will grow attached to the baby and not do either. And some of them do regret it later on. And yeah, she, she regrets it and she doesn't exactly hide that from him. And he never knew he never knew his father. And the Yeah, so so he has this really awful home life and everybody knows that his mother is a sex worker and they bully him about it. And leading to the awesome confrontation where he bites part of that guy's cheek off. You know, he's, he's like 10 years old and he bites the cheek off of one of the, uh, you know, like 15 year olds. What I love in the graphic novel, before he does that, he grabs a cigarette, a lit cigarette from the other kid's mouth and shoves it right into the guy's eye. Yeah, that is how you deal with a bully. That right there is, I'm sorry, I should not be condoning such behavior, of course. And then, it's, it's made clear in the graphic novel, but he is, we, we don't really know if he's necessarily gay, but he definitely hates women. He has no, you know, he, at, at no point does he show any kind of interest towards Lori. And, and Lori feels creeped out by him. In, in the graphic novel, pretty much everyone feels creeped out by him. And there's the, you know, the hand 
handshake with with Daniel that lasts a bit long. And in the graphic novel, there are far more examples. He sees the silhouettes of these two people close together, and what he sees is two people engaged in sexual foreplay, and he says he doesn't like it, and then he rationalizes something about that it, excuse me, it looks like it's haunted or something, excuse me. But, for example, the psychiatrist looks at the same silhouette, and he thinks of, like, I think it's him who thinks of these Hiroshima, no wait, that's Dan, he thinks of, like, Hiroshima, the you know, these people who were just, you know, there was only the, the shadow left. I think the psychiatrist also, you know, thinks of, like, a nuclear blast with it. But, but yeah, Rorschach doesn't think of death, he thinks of sex, and he doesn't like it. So, that's also a bit of a note. And, and in general, there's, there's also in the, in the film, the bit where he just passes the sex worker, who in the comic does not flash him, but yeah. And he doesn't even glance at her, he just passes straight on by, with no sign of interest in her at all. You know, even if you're not interested in the particular sex worker, you might still actually be, you know, inclined to look. And, yeah, just in general. And, and in the graphic novel, he also says that he thinks that Vate is homosexual. Must investigate further, which is pretty awesome. It is kind of yeah. He he doesn't admit to himself that he is gay, but he I would say he almost definitely is. And when when he sees in someone else, he's of course instantly like you know ah this shouldn't be you know he's it is that kind of thing of projecting. And that's also why he cries at the end, which he does in both versions. He, you know, he pulls off the mask. What are you waiting for? Do it! And he, he gets evaporated. And it's kind of... You know, he, he knows that he can't. He just, he cannot keep the secret. He will never compromise. And he knows that... Dr. Manhattan isn't going to leave him alive, and I would argue that if he, for one thing, if he tried to keep the secret, he would hate himself even more, so he would rather die than keep the secret, which is why he, and, and at the same time, he can't commit suicide, it has to be someone else, it's basically suicide by a cop, if you think about it, because he has the chance, Manhattan doesn't want to do it, he's just, he's, He's left with no other choice. And another thing is that Rorschach hates himself, and he, what he hates, he destroys. What in general, what we hate, we try to destroy. And he hates himself partially because you know it's it's one of the first lines he has. You know, all the f sex and the filth will you know wash up from the sewers and will drown in it and, and such. And at the same time, he is the offspring of this sex and filth. You know, it wasn't a... Well, we don't know if, the, if, if his mother was a sex worker when she had... I think in the graphic novel it's hinted that she was married to the man. Or they had an actual relationship. It wasn't... I'm sorry. They... It wasn't sex work, is what I'm saying. I don't mean any disrespect towards sex workers. And... It's, so, so, yeah, he... And that's also part of why he, when, when we hate something about ourselves, we go out and find it in other people and try to attack them for, the, for because we can't destroy ourselves. Uh, no matter how much we might want to, it's extremely difficult to destroy yourself, actually, to, to actually do it. A lot of people make a lot of efforts to, so some some forms of drug abuse could, uh, can also be seen as intentionally destroying yourself because you don't feel like you're good enough and to, to some extent maybe even trying to kill yourself again because you don't think you're good enough. And the people who can't do that, they find other people. You'll, you'll note that a lot of the harshest voices against homosexual uh, marriage equality, for example, and adoption rights, 
a lot of them turn out to be gay themselves. And it's because they've been taught to hate homosexuality and they know that they are themselves homosexual. And rather than, because it's so difficult to hate yourself because your body and your brain is constantly telling you you have to take care of yourself. You have to go out and, you know, shape the shape your world in your image, which is what it's, that's how evolution works, you know, the things that work well for you, you're supposed to try and go out and make work so that the strongest person will win over the, the weaker and his sort of, his way of doing things will be the way things are done and thus those traits are, you know, passed on, not only through genes but also it becomes a sort of ideal, it, you know, social adjusting, that, that kind of thing. And so when you actually hate yourself, it's extremely difficult and then it becomes an outward destruction instead. And so Rorschach is seeking out anyone who, you know, in any way does something. He's also in part getting back at bullies, of course, but you know, he, he was taught to hate himself at a very young age and then as he got a little older he learned to project that onto other people because you, you just, yeah, I've, I've made my point about the self-hatred and I could give, you know, numerous examples of people who hated themselves and, yeah, projected it onto others. Now, I think that more or less covers it. But, but yes, I, I like how with Rorschach it's the, the black and the white and the, the mask because the mask is sort of symbolic of how these the, the black and white, there's never any gray. The, the black and white colors will, you know, to change, um, uh, you know, change shapes and, and all this. And, and his black and white values change shapes. But there's never any gray area. The people who've done bad deserve to have bones broken. And I love when he, you know, crushes the guy's hand into the glass. So, yeah. That they deserve to have bones broken or maybe even be killed. There is no, you know, he he, um, he uses liberal as a sort of as an insult. He he uses it against the psychiatrist, and I don't think he said in the film, but in the graphic novel, he also uses it against Osmondias, and. Yeah, he just sees the idea of trying to fix the world rather than, you know, trying to punish the, the guilty. He sees that as, you know, too, too weak or, yeah, just at least the wrong approach. That was one thing, one, the one line I really didn't like from, for, from Ozymandias when he says, all these sacrifices will be humanity's punishment for toying with the idea of World War III. I really don't think that the Osmondias of the graphic novel would have said that. He doesn't think that he is punishing people. He thinks that he is sacrificing a lot of people to save an enormous amount of people sacrificing millions to save billions. He doesn't think of it as punishment. He just thinks of it. He, he feels terrible about it. And they do even get those lines in there. You know, he doesn't want to kill the people who are working for him. He doesn't want to... You know, he, he's, he sees all the faces and all that. He doesn't... But it's just, it's the extreme of it, and that's what I also really like, because kind of liberal, the, the liberal idea at the, at the core is kind of this do-gooder. It, it is kind of, let's fix the world together. It is a little bit hippie. And 
to, to actually get that, you know, to, to show the potential negative of that, you do have to go a bit extreme with it, and Alan Moore does, and yeah, you see that, that even that can be very bad, because it is kind of, it's also a very objective way of looking at it. It's, you know, it's, it's inconceivable to most of us, even consider, to kill so many people, even if it will benefit even more. Again, because we value life, and it just, as, as a, yeah, as a, that's kind of a given, you know, we, we value life. The people who don't value life have unlearned value, the value of life. And, or, or never learned in the first place. Maybe, maybe they were mistreated at a very, very young age. But, but yeah, it's, it's something that we wouldn't even consider. And he considered it, decided upon it, and actually did it. And, yeah, that's a very, and, and I can see it, it, it is, I would say, it is a liberal idea, it is, you know, the, I don't know, I guess maybe not the, the, actually I might need to think about, you know, let's scratch that, maybe it's not a liberal idea, but the, the result is a liberal idea. The, the, he has this idea of a utopian society where the entire world is unified, and that is a liberal idea. You know, a, a world where everyone is better off than they were before. I think I've said everything, and I've definitely prattled on long enough. Please rate and comment, and hey, if you like this video, that subscribe button's just waiting for you to click it.